Welcome to Worth the Effort Woodworking. Today I'd like to talk about design. What makes a good design? Why some designs might be better than others and how there can never really be a perfect design. Specifically, we're going to be talking about one of the most common and personal tools in our woodworking arsenal. That's just a vehicle for the broader discussion. So, let's get started. Let's talk about designing and making our own personal mallets. Oh crap! The big lesson I want people to understand is that there's reason behind good design. There's thought that goes into it, and when done right, it's practically invisible. Well, I'm sure there are people that have just stumbled into good quality designs. Most are hard fought over, encapsulating a wealth of information from a broad range of data. A good example of this is Apple. Steve Jobs was fanatical about simplicity, and that was evident in his, all his designs from the original iPhone's natural shape and single button experience to even their logo, which is a simple design but has the possibility for so much meaning. I mean, is a bite out of that Apple representation of a digital measurement? Or is it taking a bite out of the knowledge tree? Or is it a homage for, to Alan Turing? Or was it simply by having that bite in the apple that they, they could scale it down? Because if you scale down just a solid apple, it will end up looking like a cherry. Quality design, simple, elegant, but it can be interpreted and used in so many different ways. But back to our mallet. Before we begin, we've got to understand what a mallet does and its overall purpose. It may be kind of pedantic, but having a good understanding of purpose will affect design. A mallet lets us leverage gravity and potential energy with the kinetic energy provided by our skeletal muscles and joints into a controlled burst of force right at the edge of our woodworking tools. Now that's just a bunch of confusing academic gobbledygook language you might see written on a test somewhere as an answer just so the man can assume you understand something. My opinion is at this level, it's more important you understand the concepts and the fancy language. So let's just break this down a little bit. A mallet has mass. It has weight. The thing's heavy. And the reason it works is because we drop it on stuff. And within reason, the higher you drop it, the more of an impact it has. Now, when you raise a mallet up in the air, you're developing potential energy. You've expelled energy with your muscles. Your teacher will call these voluntary muscles or striated muscles because they are under your conscious control and how they look underneath the microscope. Anyways, all the energy it took to lift it up is now stored in that mallet. Think of it as an, a spring. You've wound it up and it's ready to pop. There's lots of potential energy there but until you release it, it doesn't do anything. That's what we've done when we've raised up the mallet. In that analogy, gravity is a spring, and by lifting the mallet, we wound it up. The moment you release that mallet, all that potential energy is converted into kinetic energy, the energy of motion. And what's cool is we can leverage that energy going down with more energy from our muscles also going down, so we can in theory, if we had the equal amount of energy to push down as we took to lift up, we would basically double our own power. And since power is additive, meaning for every inch it travels, I can make it go faster and faster and faster by both the gravity that's drawing it down quicker and my additive power uh, of my muscles coming down. So if I can make it travel a longer distance, it will give me more chance to increase its speed Therefore, having the mallet travel in an arc versus a straight line means I can increase its power even more. Then, at the moment of impact, all that accumulated power and energy is transferred to the tip of the chisel and it'll go about a quarter of an inch deep into the wood. But without that magnifying and leveraging effect of the mallet, we wouldn't be able to move the chisels at all. Now that we know how a mallet works, we need to define the purpose of our mallets so that we can tailor it for our specific needs. I mean, somebody needing a big rubber mallet is going to have a lot different usage 
than somebody using a small brass mallet. And if you're following along thinking that you might want to design and build your own mallet, just keep in mind what we're talking about. We might not end up building the same exact mallet you have in your mind that would be best serve your needs, but maybe our discussion will spark some improvements in your design. I will make one suggestion at this point. If you're watching this video in a classroom or in your office and just brainstorming ideas, grab a pencil, a piece of paper, something to make doodles on. Draw out your perfect design of a mallet uh, as we're doing this discussion. You can erase it, you can change it in the middle of it, but use this as a brainstorming technique. And think through it. Use all the knowledge you have from academia to your experience to your work life to your home life to what you see on movies and TVs. Wherever you can get knowledge to design the perfect mallet for your application, that's what you need to draw upon. This little discussion is just here to spark ideas and show you the thought processes a lot of us have when we design stuff. In my mind, I'm trying to think through the best choices in designing an all-around mallet for my bench. Something I'm going to be whacking my chisels with uh, when I'm cutting out waste or cutting dave toes and rabbits. I might do a little letter carving with it. Uh, I might have to do some light mortise and tenon work with it. I know I'm going to be doing some assembly work, you know, driving pegs, just banging tight things a little bit tighter. And I have to have something sturdy enough to hit my hole fast, to secure my work. It's just going to be an all-around knock-around bench, bench mount. One of the big features of our mallet design that we need to take into consideration is its overall weight. Because that will affect the experience we have with it and what we can do with it. Now we can design a really heavy mount, the weight of a small bowling ball like this miniature sledgehammer right here. Or we can do something pretty exotic the weight of this little itty bitty baby. Both of those will exact the same amount of force on our chisel. But common sense tells us that this BB has to be going a lot faster than that mallet to equal the same amount of force. We'd be having to swing in it really hard. In fact, we pretty much have to shoot it straight out of a gun to get that kind of velocity. But that's also a very good example of Newton's second law of motion. That basically states that the amount of force something can exert is equal to its mass times its acceleration. So I can have something small and light going really, really fast equal something heavy going somewhat slow. Now we have a wide variable here on our design. So now we have to put into some serious thought as what we're looking to do and how much effort we want to put into it. So that affects how heavy the force is going to be on our tool and more importantly how much effort we have to put into lifting it up and how much effort we have to put into accelerating it down. There are no free walk rides in design. It's all about choices and every single choice has a plus and a minus. So that's where we have to put in all the thought ahead of time. The shape of our mount is also a huge consideration. If any of y'all have ever played baseball, softball, tennis, golf, or just about any sport that hits a ball with a stick, you understand the concept of the sweet spot. That's the spot where wherever you strike it, it's just the inertia totally envelops the object. The vibration of the stick just kind of amplifies everything and you don't even feel the strike and there's just a perfect power transfer. Launches the ball big time. The problem is if you miss that sweet spot, hit them up here or on a baseball bat down here, you get this huge vibration that comes out and it can actually hurt your hands. Now imagine if you had a very tiny sweet spot that's just hard to find on your mallet. By the end of a long day, your hands are just going to be sore. So we need to come up with a shape where it's easy to envelop the inertia around our chisel, the striking spot, so that the sweet spot is a lot bigger, making it easier to use and less tiring in a long day. Another variable in the shape that we have to deal with is our mallets should feel like a natural extension of our arms. If it didn't, if, if it has to contort it, they're going to get very tired for using it. So we actually have to take into consideration our own bone structure in the design of a mallet. So everybody, right now, just stick your arm out to the side and get your wrist at a natural angle that feels comfortable. Now look at that. Where's the handle going to fit in your wrist? That is your natural angle. That should feel the most comfortable. That should also give you the most power in a strike and control in a strike. It feels natural. Now here's the problem. Look at this angle of the strike zone. That is wrong. 
if you start striking things, even if you have to drop your arm, that angle is going to be, the strike angle is going to be too extreme. Your chisel just bounces right off. So to compensate, we have to cant our wrist into an unnatural position in order to strike something properly and get the strike face to 90 degrees. Now we can compensate for that a little bit by changing the angle of the face of our mallet. The problem is that is a variable for how you're using your mallet. If you're just doing light cuts, you can get away with a fairly narrow angle because your wrist tends to stay above the work, above what you're striking. You start taking heavy shots, well one of the things that makes it a heavy powerful shot is your wrist drops below the strike zone. So you actually have to start canning your wrist more to get the heavier strike, to get it down below to make a very forceful strike. So we have a variable here, so now we have to take into consideration the design of how hard we are striking. We also need to take into account handle design. Its overall length and shape will affect performance and comfort. In my opinion, this is the most important part of the design that we need to work on because it's the contact patch with the tool. It's what communicates all the information from the tip of the chisel up into our brains. It affects the overall experience and satisfaction we have with the tools. And the biggest limitation in handle design has little to do with the handle itself. You remember those striated muscles that we can control? The fast twitch types that we work with while we're banging with a mallet? Well, they just don't have much endurance. The muscles in your body are generally set up in some kind of push-pull arrangement. Either the muscle designed to extend out of your joint or the muscles designed to bring it back. But in that situation, half the muscles are flexing while the other are relaxing. So your muscles have a chance to recuperate. That's how most muscles design. Plus the fact that you have generally two different types of striated voluntary muscles. They call some the fast twitch muscles. Those are the ones that give you a burst of power, like when you're weightlifting or you're boxing or you're using a mallet, a burst of power. But the thing about those is they don't have much endurance. And if you've ever been weightlifting and you got a big old heavy weight stack on and you're going up, your muscles start to twitch and then it starts to come back down, that's that endurance not coming into effect. Then your other type of muscles are generally what they call slow twitch. And even those which have a lot more endurance, those would be like the muscles you use for walking, they are still set up in a flex and relax arrangement. The leg goes forward, flex, the leg comes back, the opposite side flexes and those front sides get to relax. Now, put yourself in the position that you're building furniture all day long and you're using a mallet for carving or cutting out dovetails. If your handle is so poorly designed that you have to have a death grip on it just to keep it from flying out and hitting your altar to the woodworking god Groot, well then your hand is actually eventually going to revolt because it's in constant flexing. It's not having enough time to relax. And that kind of stuff can lead to stuff like repetitive stress injuries, carpal tunnel, or just being really, really sore the next day. That's something pretty serious to consider when you are designing your mallet. Some way to accommodate not having to have, be under constant flex just to keep the tool in your hand. The other thing we need to consider with the handle is its overall length. Because the length will affect both power and accuracy. But those are competing attributes. Because we can make a handle really long and that will give us an extremely large amount of power because the larger the arc is, we have more chance to speed up that mallet ahead. You get a bigger impact. The problem is, it's harder to control way out there. And any golf, long distance golfer will tell you that. A lot of those guys get these extremely long golf clubs just so that they can get the golf club's head speed up to ridiculous levels but then they very rarely hit the fairway. Same thing with a mallet. The longer the handle, the more power you can generate, but it's less accuracy. The other problem is, the longer the handle, the more power it takes to pick it up to speed. You have to expel a lot more force because the leverage is way out there. And if you've ever swung a sledgehammer, you know what I'm talking about. You really have to swing it hard to get it up to speed. 
Now if you shorten the handle up, it doesn't take too much power at all to get it up to a certain speed, but that speed isn't going to be as hot. Hence, a lot of people when they go out and they first start playing baseball or they start swinging a hammer, what do they do? They choke up. And in fact, shortening the hand handle to increase accuracy because nobody wants to smack your finger driving a nail. Now when you're talking shapes of mallet, there seems to be two main forms in design. This right here is what most people consider to be a workbench or a joiner's mallet. A big old hunk of wood, or a lot of times you'll see rubber or, or sledgehammers or metal, but around the joinery bench is generally wood. Uh, and you have a handle mortise into it or through it. Very common design. Uh, because you have an ingrain on the face, it can take a lot of abuse. And because it's mortise in, you can use a big hunk of wood and get a lot of weight behind it. That's why joiners really like it for mortise and tenon joinery when they really have to whack hard on it. Around, uh, around the workbench, a lot of times you will see one side of it will be faced with leather, so it's a little bit softer, so you can get momentum, but for joining, I mean, for uh, when you put two cases together and you just need a little whack to get them to go in, that nice leather won't mar the surface, and you can still get some momentum going into it. Uh, really common, and this is traditionally what people think about when you say mallet around a workbench. The other style, more people consider it a carving mallet. It's round, a lot of times it's made out of a single piece of wood, or you will have this shape with a piece of metal or brass or plastic up top, but the form is the same. Uh, the di theoretical disadvantage of this style is it is round. So theoretically, if you don't hit it dead center, it would deflect off. But in practice, that's kind of not the case. You hit it dead center, it transfers all the power to it, it can't kind of get it off the side, it's just not that big a deal. I mean, it'll bounce to the side, but it still works. And I mean, if you want to get anal about it, uh, Newton's first law of motion says that this should do the same thing. First law of motion, something in motion tends to stand motion unless an equal force acts against it, or something like that. So, typically you hit this one dead center right in that sweet spot, all the power is transferred down because there's an equal force coming back up. But if you hit it to the side, and if I use the side of it, it really exaggerates it. Basically, the inertia wants to keep going down because there's nothing over here bouncing it up. So the same thing happens if you miss hit with the handle. So that's one of those theories that in reality, in actual use, it's not that big a deal. Finally, we need to consider the materials we're going to be using. We need to consider its density, its durability, its hardness, and even its flexibility, depending upon what we are wanting to accomplish with. Now, we could use iron or steel. I mean, that has a lot of density, and, uh, and it will be definitely durable, but is it more durable than the chisels and mallets we're going to be carving with? Because personally, I would rather me dent my mallet than damage my chisel. They are a lot more valuable, and if you're adding too much force, your edges can crumble. Uh, but I will say this, other metals like brass are really common in the mallet world, especially with wood carvers, because they like its tight density. It fits in the hand for a given weight. You can really make it small and still have it weigh enough and be durable enough. There are pluses and minuses with them. The other thing we could consider, we might consider rubber. A good assembly mallet, it won't mar as much, but it doesn't have quite as much density. Uh, and I kind of question its durability when you're banging stuff like hold fast. I mean, you can see this one's chipped out and stuff like that. But it has some advantages, and it, it, it has a little friction, uh, friction ball, a little bit of compression. But there are good things about that, something we need to consider. We might consider a hard plastic, which kind of combines a little bit of the density of metal, because we can tune plastic however we want in the modern day world. And it's a lot more durable than rubber. Uh, you can design it so it doesn't mar as much. but. You have to have access to basically engineering skill to design the plastic you want and then to actually manufacture. So there are pluses and minuses there. And once again, a lot of people love brass for mounts. You see brass mounts all over the place. 
uh, because they are a little bit harder, but they when you bang them into other metals, they will dent versus something like your blade, which is a lot, lot harder. Uh, and then you have the traditional wood, which you see all the time. Now, when it comes to wood as a material, there's an infinite number of variables there. And I don't want this to get into big discussion on all the different species and their attributes and, and defects and stuff like that. If you're just making a mallet, you know this is going to be a somewhat disposable item. You're probably going to make a new one later on. You'll improve upon the design, all that kind of stuff. So for your first mallet, if all you've got is a piece of pine, make your mallet out of pine. There's nothing wrong with that. It'll probably get beat up a little bit quicker, but that'll give you a, chance, a reason to make a new improved mallet at a later date after you figure out all the plus and minuses of your design. But I do want to show you a few of the variables. Now, if you just want to play it safe, just pick a wood species that has traditionally been used to make baseball bats or other people have used to make mounts and you should be happy with it. It's not that big a deal. Uh, my opinion is free wood's the best wood, so all these ones I'm about to show you were just trees that fell down in the neighborhood that somebody happened to live in. Here's my first mallet. My dad made this for me back in 2008 when he was up in Wisconsin. It was It's just a piece of hickory. A really good species for traditionally used in making uh, mallets because it has a lot of uh, impact resistance and is very durable. Uh, I mean this thing you would not believe the abuse I put on it and look at how much it's dented up or splintered and stuff like that. It, it's a really good mallet but look at the handle size compared to my hand, the shape, the shape of the head, the proportions of the head, all those are design aspects. But for the species wise, hickory worked out very well for us. Uh, I want to say this, I used this mallet as my go-to mallet all the, way up, all the way up until I started the school and I had to start making a bunch of mallets for my students and I started playing around with designs so I finally made myself my own mallet. And here's some of the ones that I've made for the school. Uh, this one's made out of walnut and I'll tell you I'm not that fond of it. It's just a little bit too light. And this is one of the last ones I made. I just actually pulled it out of storage uh, for students to use a few months ago. And it's just getting beat up really, really quickly. Uh, all the other mountain walnut ones I made just kind of blew up for some one reason or the other. Once again, hickory. Very, very durable. Uh, I would stay away from the sapwood, though. It tends to splinter a little bit more. It's not quite as durable. Uh, but this is a... a a one that grew in Texas where there's a lot less water than up in Wisconsin so it grew real slower and it ha isn't, doesn't seem to dent as much as the, my, the one my dad made. Now pecan is part of the hickory family. You would think it would be very durable but man does it dent easily and the handles are broken on several of my pecan ones. They just have not done as well. Another Texas species that you would think would be extremely durable is mesquite. But mesquite is really hard when it's fully dry, when it's wet, it's actually kind of soft. But the thing about mesquite is because it's a slow growing tree, the cells don't overlap that much. And here's a good example. You have a deck of cards right here. Just a simple deck of cards. You get some species that have their cell structure that overlap quite a bit. So I'll shuffle them up for us real quickly. So, if it overlaps quite a bit, there's a lot of strength in there. It's not going to break apart. But, if you don't have much overlap in the cells, messing this up, you don't have much overlap in the cells, it will just snap apart. That overlap gives it a lot of the durability. So, mesquite is not a very good striking, striking wood. So, I'd kind of stay away from that unless you just want something that looks really cool. My favorite has been Bodart. Uh, this is one I made, uh, cup, I want to say about a year ago, and this was green wood when I made it. I mean, it was so wet when I turned it, it was throwing water in my face, and I literally took it to the lathe and put it, through, put it to work. And when it was green, it dented slightly, but a lot less than the hickory did, and I've, done th I've really abused this one. When you tr first make it, it's going to be yellow, like that right there, actually a little bit yellow, more yellow than this. And I really like Bodart. It is a fruit tree, 
So I have a feeling a lot of the other fruit trees like apple will be just as well just because of the cell structure and how they are done and the reputation fruit trees have. So if you want a good wood and you have the money or you have an orchard around you, go find a fruit tree. Uh, Bodart, I really do like it for my mounts and this, I'm pretty much going to stick with Bodart for a while until I find something better. Now I am quite positive there are aspects to building a mallet that I haven't can taken cons into consideration yet. And if there's something I've overlooked as a major flaw, please tell us in the comments below so that we can all benefit. But these are the aspects that I've used to kind of design something for us around the school use and something that I enjoy using at my personal workbench. Now I've taken a concerted effort not to try and sway you one way or the other as I describe these different features because I wanted you to come up with your own design to work your own way to be able to do your own stuff. So if you not, haven't finished doodling out what you think is the perfect mallet, take this time to do it now. Pause the video, go ahead and get that done. Because from here on out, we're actually going to build a mallet here based upon my thinking. And if you've already got a kind of solidified view of what you want, you can listen to my reasoning. And if you agree with it, maybe you can make adjustment. If you disagree with it, maybe you can make adjustments based on that. That say, oh, he's totally wrong. I'm going to go the opposite way. Worst case scenario, you make a mallet that doesn't work as optimally as you want. So you make another one later on down the road. Now, I do want to say this here. This is not a woodworking technique video. I'm going to be turning a mallet using tools and stuff like that. And I have, I've created a video that shows you all the woodworking techniques that I call wood turning demystified, where I actually make a earlier version of this very mallet. So you can see the same process for this thing with an explanation of why I'm using a tool a certain way. So if you're le wanting to learn to wood turn, that might be a good introduction. But this is going to be more of a video about the design and why I'm doing something a certain way. So if you're ready, let's get turning. Okay, as I said earlier, I prefer Osage Orange or Bodart for, the, for making mallets at the moment. And I have a blank right here that came from the same exact tree that I uh, made my personal mallet that I've been using for about a year now on. Uh, this is actually the, the first tree I actually murdered myself. We cut it down. It was on a ranch uh, up in North Texas. Uh, the farmer was getting uh, clearing some pasture land. Now I want you to know something about this. The, the growth rings on this particular blank are practically horizontal because this was a huge Osage orange tree. And I tried to get the uh, blank as far close to the outside of the tree as possible that way the growth rings will be fairly straight that way in case there is any warpage due to the fact that moisture is still coming out of this big thing it wouldn't be as extreme because the grains were pretty much flat to begin with i've got just a tad bit of a uh, sap wood on the outside which will be cut out which tells you how far to the edge i went to this tree uh, we are nowhere near close to the pith on this one. Also, the length is a tad bit longer than my blank is. Now, this one right here is the one I based it on. There are a few aspects to this one that I do not like that I will go over as we are modifying the one we are currently creating. Okay? Uh, the big thing, though, is I did like the weight of this one. This one is coming in about 15 ounces. So, I took this diameter as my largest diameter and that's the first thing we're going to do we're going to turn this blank right here into the largest diameter right there and that is approximately three inches
Okay, so now that I got the total diameter approximately um, three inches, a little bit more, but I'll be shaving off some more a little bit. Uh, now I'm going to set out the total length, and I laid out the length I'm going after on this little board right here. So now I just lay that out. Now this length I'm going for is basically about twice the width of my hand, maybe a tad bit more, because I wanted the handle, I, I didn't need a, a very big mallet for the kind of work I'm doing. I'm doing light hits, I'm not hitting it very hard, I'm just chopping minor things out. So I didn't need to whack very hard. So just rotating it around my wrist is all about I ever need. And that gave me the weight, and because it's closer, I felt more control. One of the reasons why I like this design over the standard style is because the hit point. Look at how close it is to my fingers. It's really close to my hand. Whereas if I had the square mallet style, even though it might be the same weight, the strike point was farther away from my hand. So I'd have to pay a little bit more attention. And when you're getting tired on a long day, that makes a difference. One of the reasons why I kind of go against the grain preferring a carving style mallet versus uh, more traditional style mallet. So now that I have that dimensions, I'm going to set the diameter for the biggest part of my handle, which is this back section right here. Now that is a little bit bigger than the midpoint, and this particular midpoint is a little bit too big for me, and I'll explain that while in a second. But it's e I can't add wood on, so now I'm going to come down to this diameter and come down to the middle section, which I also have laid out on my guide. So here we go. I'm going to come down on both sides to set the length and then I'm going to set the, the width of the handle. The biggest part of my handle is this cutout on the little board right here, which is about an inch and three eighths. Okay, so now I set out the length and the width. I left a fraction of an inch on the this side, and I'll show that to you why in a second. So this is my total length, and this is the diameter of my handle that I want it to be. So now I'm going to clear out the waist for the handle section. Now I need to reset my handle of the length because I removed that pencil mark. Now we need to talk about the handle. I want you to notice I have a fairly big knob on the end. That's one of those uh, aspects because I didn't want to have to hold on to this mallet. In fact, this mallet right here, I just let dangle in my hand. There's, I have almost no pressure squeezing it. So I'm not going to have that death grip. My hand's not going to be tired. It just sits here and dangles in my hand. I have so little hand pressure holding this thing down. It's just nothing. You know, one of the big aspects is because my back hand can rest against that little knob right here. Now, on this handle design, the back section is a little bit thicker 
I mean thinner than the front section. This is about seven eight. This is about an inch, and this is about seven eighths. I actually like those two dimensions. But what I don't like about this handle design is the high point for this crest section, which is about an inch and a quarter. That needs to fit in the dead center of your palm. And this one right here is just a tad bit too far forward so I can actually feel it. On other ones I've built where I've moved this back ever so slightly, the handle practically disappears. So not only am I not having to hold it, I barely feel it because it conforms to the shape of my palm. So the first thing I need to do is I need to set the depth for this end and the depth for that end. This is 7 eighths of an inch, which I have a mechanical wrench that's 7 eighths, and the other side is 1 inch, which I also have a 1 inch one. So that's what I'm going to do now. Okay, so now that I've got the depth of the back and the depth for the front, I'm going to go ahead and set the total length. And I'm going to shape this back section right here. And then I'm going to lower this middle section until it comes to a point where it feels comfortable for me to wrap my hand around, at which point I will set the high point based upon my diagram of my past experience, and I will blend those two in to get a nice curve. Now I'll refine this a little bit more in a second. But now I need to make the mallet head. Okay? I'm going to bring you over to the front because now I'm going to set the total distance of the mallet head. Now I want you to notice I'm going to make it concave. I'm going to veer it in. That way it's going to veer in this way like a minor bowl. That way it will sit flat when I lay it on my bench. Also the fact that allows me a third way to use this mallet because I can actually do some minor carving by tapping on this end. Plus the fact that end grain is so much harder that when I set my hold fast, a lot of times I just bang it like this. So having that little concaveness has multi-functions and I'm going to set that with my skew chisel. Now we're going to shape the head of the mallet. And if you remember earlier, we were talking about that strike angle and how it is an advantage to have a slight angle so you didn't have to cant your wrist over it so much when you were hitting it. Now this mallet that I've been using right now has a slightest of curves to it. 
compared to the one my dad designed that was almost straight across. Well, that slight angle and that slight curve really made a lot bigger difference than you would think because uh, I basically didn't have to angle my wrist as much, but that slight curve let me change the angle. So if I was hitting a very hard strike, I would just strike it a little bit closer to the handle side and the curve would, it makes the angle a little bit steeper. If I'm doing very light taps, I could hit it more towards the, the toe side and the, stang, the angle was a little bit slighter. It doesn't sound like much, but just that little bit of difference made a whole world of difference in the feel. Plus the fact that having this taper down means I have a lot more weight on the end. That weight on the end increases that sweet spot, that honey spot where wherever I strike something, the vibration doesn't come back to my hand. It's something about the heavy momentum being out here in front and it coming around that arc, I'm throwing the momentum forward. Uh, it's a little bit of physics that you can look up into. So this next step we're going to do, I'm going to first create a taper that connects the the toe to the heel in a somewhat straight line and then you're going to come see me come back and create a slightest of curve within that straight line. So let's get that done. I also took the time to put a little bead on the end. That prevents if I miss hit, it won't chip out as badly. Okay, the next thing we're gonna worry about is this transition from the mallet head to the handle. This little curve right here has become crucial to my designs because it makes it so much more comfortable when not only am I holding it, how it fits in the web of my hand, but a lot of times, maybe a third of the time, I actually hold it by the head of the mallet and my little pinky can just slide in there. I have found that any con convexness outside curve really does distract me. It makes it uncomfortable. Where the slightest concave curve lets my pinky just fit in there perfectly so I don't even have to grip the mallet at all when I'm holding it. I'm not having to squeeze it to hold it like this. And the web of my hand, because my hand is con concave, it fits in the con, excuse me, my hand is convex, it fits in the concaveness just perfectly, so I don't even have to hold it, I can just dangle it. So that convex curve is critical in the comfort and functionality of the mallet. So let's add that. So if you notice, now we have a slight curve coming down here, but the overall angle connects this point down to this point. So I have a nice consistent angle, and I have a slight convexus that blends perfectly into the handle. So there's no little lip for me to grab onto. It makes it so much more comfortable to have smooth angles all the way through. Now that the section is this back knob. I want a little lip there so that my, the back of my hand will kind of feel it so I can tell when it's about to slide. And notice there's very little play here. So the handle just about fits my hand or hand slightly bigger comfortably. And that's what we're talking about by designing stuff for your, ourselves. So at this point, I'm basically going to sand all the little minor ridges out. After that, you will see me turn down these, corn, these ends on either end to a little cone and then I'll just chisel them off and use either sandpaper or a little gouge to smooth it out.
Okay, what you're about to see me do is take a little bit of beeswax. And I'm going to put a very carefully measured amount all over this mallet uh, because if you put too much, nothing bad will happen. And then I'm going to take another piece of paper, turn the lathe on, and I'm going to create heat by friction. And that's going to melt the beeswax into the top layer of the wood. That's going to do a couple different things. It's going to give me a somewhat durable finish. And it's going to kind of fill the pores so that water evaporation in and out of the mallet will slow down so it's not going to crack. So let's apply a little bit of wax, create some heat, and make a nice looking finish. And there we go, a little Bodart Osage Orange Mallet. Uh, I like this design. Uh, it kind of goes back to that original principle where I said quality design is practically invisible. If you look at that, there's no real ornamentation to it. There's nothing, no pizzazz whatsoever. But it has a nice elegant fit and when you look at that you can tell it was put together on purpose this way. It was designed this way. Every single element of it has a purpose, it has a function. The little knob on back, the shape with a fairly steep angle allows a good fit with my fingers to tell when it's about to go away. So I might grip it a little bit more or I'll just keep it that way. It just kind of keeps it from hanging out. The shape of the handle, the top crest right there just is a perfect fit for my palm. So I don't have to grip it and yet I have a good contact patch. The difference between the thickness here and here is just how your palm fits nice and easy. The curve right there, not only does it fit into the web of your palm, but it gives your pinky a little resting place when you hold it like this. And a lot of times I do my letter carving and stuff, this is how I hold it. It's very easy to control it that way. The dome would effect on the bottom if I'm ever doing chip carving with an actual chisel and I'm taking very, very light taps just for control, I'll use this dome aspect of it and hold it and just kind of tap on the side. Plus the fact it allows it to sit on my workbench and I don't have to worry about it rolling off. There's nothing about this design that doesn't have a function. And that's kind of what I like about when I think through something. Whether it be a table or a chair, if every single part of it has some kind of design function, I know it's not only going to look right, it's going to function right, but I'll be proud of it when I'm done. Now your mallet might not come out looking like mine. You might have more of a traditional style and all of that is okay as long as every single element of it has a function. Now, if you're watching this video in a class or a homeschool environment, I have a homework assignment for you. A little creative writing assignment that I'd like to you to do. I want you in no less than 750 words and no more than a thousand words I want you to come up with a non-lethal weapon for one of the science fiction universes. But the key thing is, every single design element, I want you to have a reason for adding that to your non-lethal weapon. And what do I mean by a, a known science fiction universe? Something like the, the Three Towers, or Marvel, or Star Wars, Star Trek, something like that. Something where it will fit in that environment and work in that environment. I hope you enjoyed this video. It's the first in a series of standalone lessons I'm going to be doing in addition to some series lessons for the homeschool and after school and public school environment. If you liked it, 
please subscribe, and most importantly, tell your friends. And if you want to go a little bit farther, if you'll visit our website, worththeeffort.com, I have a little support area where you can see how you can give us a little bit more support. I hope you enjoyed it. And please remember, it is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.